Good morning. Thank you for uh, coming to the Penn State Lectures on the Frontiers of Science. My name is Barbara Kennedy. I'm the chair of the organizing committee for the lecture series, which the Penn State Eberly College of Science is pleased to be able to provide to you. Uh, the funding for this lecture series comes from the Eberly College of Science, and we also are grateful to our speakers who volunteer their time to give their lectures to you. Our theme this year is your genes, how they contribute to who you are. Today's event is the fifth lecture in our series of six weekly lectures this year. Our speaker today is Dr. Glenn Gerhardt. Um, I learned just now that Dr. Gerhardt went to um, Easterly Parkway School. Um, not only that, but he got his Bachelor's of Science degree at Penn State, and he also got his Medical MD degree at Penn State. So he's, he's local boy made really good. He now is a professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology and the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at Penn State. And he's also an adjunct staff scientist in the Department of Pathology at the Geisinger Clinic. And he's a member of the Penn State Hershey Institute of Personalized Medicine. He also is on the editorial boards of two research journals, and his extensive research program includes projects that are funded by the National Institutes of Health and the U.S. Centers for Disease Control. The goal of his research program is to identify genetic variants that underlie the susceptibility to common and clinically important human diseases and conditions, including aging, cancer, malaria, problems with iron metabolism, and obesity. Another thing I learned about him is that he recently achieved a senior Olympic qualifying time for the 800 meter run, which might be one of the ways that he keeps his own weight within normal range. The title of his lecture today is Genetics of Obesity and Weight Loss. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Glenn Gerhardt. Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, sound okay for everybody? Okay, great. Um, thank you. It's a pleasure to be back. As, as Barbara said, I, I have uh, State College and, and University Park is a, holds a very special uh, place for me. I should also say that uh, I'm a double alum, legacy of a double alum as well, so um, get my dad in the picture too. Uh, okay, so uh, today I'll uh, describe to you uh, what we know about uh, the genetics of obesity and, and some about uh, weight loss. Uh, we'll go over some basic facts about obesity so that everybody's all on the same page. We'll, we'll uh, talk about uh, some of the genetics, and then I'll, I'll get into uh, some bar uh, aspects of bariatric surgery, uh, which is some of the research that I've been involved in. Oops, let's go backwards. Okay, first of all, uh, what is obesity? Uh, obesity is defined by the term uh, body mass index or called BMI, which is a way to express body weight but correcting for height. So in, in the um, metric system, it's the weight in kilograms divided by the height in meters squared. If you want to do that in, um, in pounds, uh, you can take your uh, weight in pounds, uh, divide it by the square of your height in inches, and then multiply by 703. Okay, so normal weight is defined as a range of the BMIs from 20 to 25 or thereabouts. Overweight is from 25 up to 30, and obese is considered over 30. Now, that goes on. There, is, um, there are other terms that refer to the degree of obesity as you go up in, in body mass index from 30 to 40 to 50 to 60 to 70 to 80 to 90. There's a very wide range at that end of the weight spectrum. And those are uh, patients, as I'll describe, who have uh, a lot of health issues and we're very interested in understanding um, how they are way out at that end of the population spectrum. So to put this into some real context, um, you guys can, I think it's in the, this, this is a, 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 a version in your handout that you can see. And so you can go through here and so, for me, I'm 
510, which is 70 inches and about 150 pounds. So my BMI is somewhere between 21 and 22. So you can see if I was weighed 175, I'd be considered overweight. And if I was about 210, I'd be considered obese. So just, just so you guys have a, a, a sense for, the, the, the BMI is, is, again, correcting for height. <clears throat> but it's a measure that is used in the, in the clinic uh, to gauge uh, obesity. And as a sort of pictorial thing, you can see as you go from normal weight to a bit overweight to obese as the uh, increase in fat mass for the most part. Now, this is where um, there's lean body mass, meaning muscle, and fat. So somebody, if, if I, for example, went on a big weight training program and was able to, you know, look like RG3, um, my BMI would go up, and that would not necessarily have the same implications health-wise as if it were all fat. So the source of the, the body weight is, is important. Oop, let me go back here. So that leads to the, the cartoon that says, uh, it's a genetic thing. My parents are too short for their weight, too. So that just drives home the message about using BMI as the... Um, uh, as the measure of obesity. Okay, so obesity per se is, is not necessarily a, a bad thing. Um, uh, I've talked about this with, with colleagues. Um, it, actually, there is one, um, one good thing about obesity, especially uh, in women, and that is uh, bone density increases because your bones respond to... Um, force and the bigger you are the more gravitational force there is and the bones are uh, bones in obese women tend to be denser than than the bones of normal weight women however there's a lot of other things that are not so good uh, in regard to obesity um, there is there are a number of psychosocial issues um, from eating disorders poor self-esteem poor body image um, Obesity affects the lungs. Obstructive sleep apnea is one of the major uh, things. Um, in the gastrointestinal system, the liver tends to be filled with fat because of the increased caloric intake, and the fat in the liver can progress to inflammation, which is actually a form of hepatitis that doesn't, it's not associated with viruses. It's a fat-induced inflammation that can lead to scarring and fibrosis and even cirrhosis. This is a very now um, common form of liver disease in the population and is increasing in the reason for, uh, for liver transplantation. And it's due, the original source is due to the obesity and the increased fat. Um, there are obviously uh, musculoskeletal issues. Again, the gravitational effects of body weight on joints. So uh, there tends to be uh, osteoarthritis and other uh, musculoskeletal joint issues from the increased uh, mass. Uh, cardiovascular disease, this is the, the sort of, uh, it's called the metabolic syndrome. Obesity is related to uh, alteration in blood lipids, so high cholesterol, high triglycerides, low HDL, all, all things in the wrong direction. Uh, insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes and hypertension. Um, my uh, colleague, uh, Chris Still, uh, who's at Geisinger, he calls that the Pennsylvania package, which un unfortunately is probably not what you'd want to uh, uh, see in the population. And then there are a number of, of endocrine things. So overall, the obesity, again, per se, is, is not necessarily bad unless you suffer from, from one or more of these common comorbid conditions. Um, one of the things from a genetics point of view that we're very interested in is that we have patients who are uh, severely obese and yet they do not suffer from any of these. They're apparently healthy. And we're puzzled why, how somebody could have a BMI of over 50 and not have high blood pressure or have some problem with their uh, blood glucose or um, some problem with their blood lipids. But there are people who seem to be protected, and we're, we're interested. We think there may be a genetic reason for that, so we're interested in trying to find out why some people uh, are, not, um, are not afflicted by uh, the, the various uh, health risks for obesity. 
Okay, so all those different health risks, this was a, a cartoon in the New York Times a couple years ago, and basically the bottom line is that um, there's an obese person whose who's button pops off and then it causes all these problems worldwide, so obese people must be the cause of all, all problems. And I think this was when there was a study that came out that global warming was because people were obese, which is a little far-fetched. Okay, so to, sh to illustrate that uh, nationally and in Pennsylvania why this is a problem, I'm going to show you a series of slides that are from the Centers for Disease Control from the CDC. And you can follow, um, you can follow your favorite state, so um, you can follow Pennsylvania. So this started in 1985, and they, they started collecting data from each state as to BMI data, so what percentage of patients had uh, a BMI that would put them at, uh, at 30 or more. So how many, what percentage of the population were obese? So the different colors, as we click through, you'll see the colors change. So they go from, uh, from pale to, to darker blue, and then they'll go to red. And um, it's probably hard to see, but so the blue right now is if the, the percent of obese was uh, 10 to 14%. So there's a couple of states there in 1985, and Pennsylvania is not one of them yet, but then by 1989, Pennsylvania, the percentage of uh, people had a BMI, uh, the, the number who were BMI 30 or more who were obese was 10% um, uh, to 14%. And then as we go through, you can see some states are leading the country in the, in the increase in the population that are um, becoming obese. So there we are by 1994, 93 range. Pennsylvania is one of those that are now, the percentage is up to 15 to 19%. We go through, so now we're up to uh, greater than 20%, and Pennsylvania achieved that in 2000. So we're sort of right in the middle of the pack, I guess, if you will, in terms of um, catching up with the rest of the country. And as we go on now with greater than um, 25%, is that where we're at now? Or greater than 30%. So now by 2007, these are the states, the orange, um, the orange is greater than 25%, and then this couple of southern states down here are greater than 30% of the population have a BMI or obese. And I think it ends in 2010. So this is the last set of data they had. So as if the trends are as they were in the past, probably by now Pennsylvania is one of the states that would um, have uh, at least 30% of the population who were obese. Now. What these data don't show is that there's also 30% of the population who are overweight. So these, those maps I just showed you were only for the BMI 30 and greater. The proportion that were 25 and greater also went along with that. So right now, if in the, in the overall in the US, it's about a third of the population who are obese, about a third who are overweight, and about a third who are considered uh, normal weight. And with all those health risks that I just showed, you can see that that is a very um, uh, large uh, issue for the healthcare system to be able to now with all that, the people who are obese and who are afflicted with the various uh, aspects of, uh, that are related to obesity, um, there's obviously an interest in trying to figure out um, how to solve this problem. Okay, so how do you solve the problem? Well, the, the first thing is, well, what causes obesity? And unfortunately, it's, it's a basic physics problem. It's the first law of thermodynamics, which is the conservation of energy, which basically means the calories, or the official term is kcal, but those are what you know as calories. It's calories in versus calories out. That's basically the simplistic bottom line. Now, there's a lot of complicated things that determine that calories in and calories out, but that's the bottom line in terms of, um, of uh, are accumulating uh, excess uh, body weight. And obviously the big players in that are, are diet and um, exercise and then basic metabolism. And I'll talk about a couple of these. So that, that energy balance. So obviously intake, there's various aspects of, of intake. There's the, your appetite and then whether you reach a satiety, which means are you um, done eating or are you still hungry? 
And then how long does that last? So those are all very important things that are studied at, at all different levels, including at the genetic level. Uh, storage, um, most of the excess energy that uh, a person consumes will be stored as, um, as fat, unless there's a whole lot of activity and you put demand on the muscles that they, the muscles will respond and will put down, uh, take that energy and convert it in, uh, into increased muscle mass. And then there's expenditure, which is basic uh, basal metabolism, just the energy you need to exist and live and breathe. And then there's the activity that you, uh, you do in addition to that. So I'm gonna give you uh, some, a, a little bit of math here. It's, it's um, a little bit complicated, but if, you, if you'll bear with me, we'll go through. And, and just to show you how tightly regulated this energy balance and this first law of thermodynamics is, to illustrate how a weight gain of 30 pounds over 20 years can occur. So 30 pounds we convert into um, the metric system to, um, to, to for the calculations. That's about 454 grams per pound, and it's fat for the most part, so we're talking about 30 pounds of fat. Fat has nine calories per gram, so that's 122,000 calories about. And that's, that's how much extra calories that would be stored as fat to gain 30 pounds over 20 years. So if we divide that 122,000 by 20 years, that's the calories per year. Divide it by the number of calories per week, divide by the number of days per week, you come out with an excess of 11 calories per day, which is one potato chip. So if you just have an extra one potato chip a day, each day for the next 20 years, you're gonna gain 30 pounds. So that shows you that it sounds simple, calories in, calories out, but it's actually very complicated. And, and there's a lot of factors that impinge on that one potato chip excess, if you will. Okay, so what causes obesity? We know that it's calories in, calories out, but there are genes, there's environment, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about new research that's going on that, um, that is a part of the system that people had neglected for years, and that's the, the um, microbes, the bacteria that live inside uh, the, uh, the intestine in the gut. So, the way that most uh, researchers in obesity think about genes versus environment, and this is true for not just obesity, but it's true in many, many other, in fact, people who were here listening to previous speakers, I'm sure that they brought up a uh, relationship between genetics and, and environment. Um, for obesity, if you consider that if you have a genetic predisposition where you're either resistant or you're susceptible to obesity, if you're in a, in a certain environment, restrictive environment, there's no obesity. You're, you're, it doesn't matter what your genes are, if you're in the certain environment, it's, it's just not gonna happen. If you're in what's called an obesogenic environment, that allows the expression of those genes or allows those genes to actually have an effect, and then the population's BMI will, will be increased depending on how susceptible they are, how genetically susceptible they are. So to illustrate a couple of these environments, so the environment is absolutely rules over genetics depending on what the situation is. You go back to the 19, early 1940s, so go back to 1940 to 45 in Europe or even in the US, there was rationing. There were even posters about people making sure they, uh, they uh, would obey. Europe was starving. Doesn't matter what your genes are. If there's no food around, it's energy in, energy out. If there's no energy in, you're gonna lose weight. That's just bottom line. And here even in um, this one I found interesting, this was in Denmark, um, I believe it was Denmark, or Holland, sorry. For one week, uh, the ration was 400 grams of bread which I just showed you was basically one pound of bread for a week. And they had policemen stationed there to make sure people didn't cheat. So in that environment, the genes of the people in Europe and the US from 1940 to 1945 
It's basically the same people or their descendants. The genes haven't changed. But what has changed is the environment. There's enough potato chips there to last more than 20 years for one person. <laughs> so we now are in a, in a wholly different environment that's actually relatively new for the human species. If you go back, food was not, very, was not really plentiful until really 1900s, mid to late 1900s. So the fact that now obesity is increasing is, is in part because the environment is allowing the genetics to bloom, if you will. And that has um, caused um, a, 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 a hypothesis called the thrifty genotype hypothesis. And obviously thrifty means that you're very efficient and, and, and at, at things. Um, so the thrifty genotype means that, that there, we, had, we have inherited genes from ancestors who were selected by the environment, famine, ice age drought, crop failures, um, all sorts of reasons for why food was a, a scarce resource uh, more than a couple of hundred years ago. So the people who survived in those times were ones who when there was food available, they ate it and they were able to store it efficiently. So they were able to um, survive and pass on those genes. Well, a lot of us have those people as, as our descendants. And so at the time, that was very favorable for their survival because they are, were in an, a, an environment where uh, obesity was not an issue. Now the environment's changed. So again, the thrifty genes uh, came, they were from, caused the ancestors to eat a lot and store the energy efficiently. And what that has done uh, on this side, uh, the little busy slide, but over here, so the thing, the aspects that can be sort of measured is that increased, you have a, a tendency to want high-density high foods, so increased fat intake, larger meal size, uh, eating more at a single meal, eating more frequently, and then eating soon after you're done. So all those things you might associate with somebody who's in a situation where you never know when the next meal may come in, they're going to try to eat. As, so that's sort of the genetic legacy that we all live with today, or, or a lot of us live with today. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out what are those genes and is there anything we can do about it from um, a, a medical standpoint. The other thing is, the other thing that's changed is we were built to exercise. Um, for the most part, until again the last couple of generations, a lot of humanity was an agrarian farm-based society where there was a lot of physical labor. And now things have changed in the last generation or two. It's, it's now a, um, there's a lot of technology to assist in all those things that, that we used to expend a lot of calories doing. So that's another aspect of the environment that's changed. And so this is where uh, a cartoon for showing how we're evolving from our ancestors surviving from the Ice Age to present to where we're heading. Okay, so as I said, the environment is, is sort of the absolute uh, uh, determinant of, of obesity. In today's environment, um, it's, it's an obesogenic environment that allows genes to have a, a, an impact. So why do we think there might be genetics or genes involved in determining body weight or obesity? Well, it turns out that, that body weight, BMI, is one of the most highly inherited uh, uh, traits in, in human populations. It, it's the degree to which your body weight is determined is strongly genetic. In, and again, in an obesogenic environment. And one of the, the ways that um, scientists figure this out is uh, using twin studies. So monozygotic or identical twins can be studied versus the dizygotic or the non-identical twins who are basically just uh, siblings who, who happen to uh, have been born together. And uh, body weight is much more concordant in the 
um, monozygotic twins than it is in the dizygotic twins. There are also, um, and that leads to this uh, cartoon for the, the, it says, genetics nonsense, my brother is a jockey. So just showing that, um, that genetics may, can play an extremely role, a huge role, even in the same family. So it determines which sibling happens to get the, the right or wrong mix of genes for uh, the current obesogenic environment. Um, the other thing is, this is not just in people. This also is in um, different animals, and one of the most widely used um, uh, animals in research is the mouse. And there was a, a mouse known as the obese mouse. Uh, it's called OB for obese. Obese mouse, which there's, there's one right here. It ate a lot and got a lot bigger than its normal, uh, its normal uh, litter mates. So one of the first experiments uh, that was done to figure out, well, what's going on here? Is it something that is, you know, what, what is it about this obese mouse? So, really cool experiment. They're able to take two mice and basically connect their um, uh, bloodstreams so that their blood is flowing between both mice. So they share their blood, basically. And so, they connected the, the obviously the big obese mouse here and the normal mouse, and so now the blood is, is sharing between. So that means whatever is in the obese mouse is now going through the bloodstream of the, of the uh, lean mouse and vice versa. So what happened when that was done? So here's the lean mouse, the obese mouse. We put them together in that thing called parabiosis where they share, and the obese mouse gets lean. So that means the lean mouse has something in its blood that the obese mouse did not. And so when the obese mouse finally got whatever it was in that blood, it corrected its, uh, its behavior such that it, dropped, it lost weight and it became a, a, a lean, normal mouse. That was a source that the... the um, this was known to be genetic, and so there was a, 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 a lot of um, intense investigation, and what was found is a, a, a protein called leptin. It circulates in the blood, and it works. It's made in the fat. This is showing fat cells here, so the genes in the fat actually make this thing, uh, this protein leptin that goes into the blood, and it goes to the brain, and it tells you that you're full. So it's sort of a, an appetite rheostat, if you will. So as you gain weight and you increase the fat, it comes from the fat, so that means there's more fat around. It's going to make more leptin. The leptin's going to turn off your, your appetite. It also turns out it, it increases activity as well, but its pr pr predominant effect is to, to turn off your, your um, to, for satiety and to have you stop eating. Conversely, as you lose weight and your f amount of fat decreases, you, inc um, you decrease leptin so that you don't feel full when you're eating, so you eat more. So in other words, your body's basically trying to, it uses leptin to regulate, based on the amount of fat mass you have, um, your body weight. So you're, as your fat increases, it, your body's telling you, no, 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 stop eating, and if, as you decrease, oh, you better start eating because your, your fat mass. The, the problem is, as we have found, uh, as, as researchers have found, is that there tends to be levels reached, and as you increase to a new, to a, a, a higher body weight, your body tends to defend that new level. So as you gain weight, your body thinks that's the new normal. And as you start to lose weight, it's like, oh, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, you need to stay there. So, so it, it, you, you tend to be tend to be this upward notching of body weight, and it's harder to get back down. And leptin, leptin plays a role. So it turns out that, in the, that leptin was mutated and not working in the OB mouse, which is why when the lean mouse bloodstream came over, it replaced it because it was gone in the OB mouse. It didn't have any leptin. Turns out there are some people, rare, rare in the world, a couple of people in the world that have mutations in leptin. And if you give them leptin, by injection, it corrects their obesity, which is what happened to this child here. Oops. 
There's another uh, gene like leptin called MC4R. It's a melanocortin-4 receptor gene, which is, we, that's why we call it MC4R. It also is mutated in mice and in people. And the reason I mention it now is when, I, when we get to the next part of the more common variants, MC4R uh, plays, a, plays a role. So the leptin and the MC4R, the mutations that cause obesity in people that in those genes is very, 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 very rare. And so what, the, and because now we have 30% of the country that is obese, there's no way those genes are gonna explain that obesity. So that has led to studies on what are called common variants. And this is a long phrase. You probably may have heard it from a previous speaker, single nucleotide polymorphisms, SNP, or SNPs. That's, that's what we call them in the, the lingo we use. They're called SNPs. And all they are is um, <coughs> DNA is just four letters, A, G, C, T, that's just very long uh, HCGTs in, in sort of run-on sentences, if you will, that um, the, the precise, uh, uh, there's codes of which that, that encode for all your, your proteins. So you get um, a copy from mom and a copy from dad. Most of us are 99% identical. So there's three billion of these A, C, Gs, and Ts. But about one every 500 or so 10, 20, 30 percent of the population is different from everybody else. And that's called a SNP, that one spot. So here you can see mom and dad at this position right here. One of these is different from the other. So that means uh, in this person here, if they had this, this, this from mom, this from dad, they would have a G and an A right there. Whereas if somebody else had two of these, they would be AA, or if they had two of these from mom and dad, they would be GG. And that's how there's one in 500 over three billion. There's actually now millions and millions of these, which I'll get to, but I wanna give a common example so that you guys can, can see how some of you have one, uh, one SNP and some of you have another SNP. So, blood type. How many here, let me just go to the, so, so let's, uh, basic background. So blood type, there's basically, uh, there's blood group O, A, B, and AB, okay? They're genetically determined. They're also vary a bit by uh, population. So in the US, O is, is the most common, and you can see in, and B is the least common, only about 7%. And in other countries like Africa and, and Asia, the frequency of B is, is much higher. So who here in the audience knows their blood type is blood group O? So boy, that looks pretty good for probably 67%. We're pretty close. Who's blood group A? So almost as many, which here is a little bit higher A. How about blood group B? Okay, there's far less of us. I'm a B as well. How about the ABs? And very few. Okay, so this audience fits pretty well with the, with the population. So, so O's were the most by far, right? So, and, and you guys are the, you know, the universal donor, so you, you know, your cells are good for anybody. It's, well, guess what, genetically, you guys are the mutants. <laughs> Turns out that the protein that um, is, is involved here. You guys have what's called a deletion, so you're missing a G here. And when you, it's like a, you know, if you take a, 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 a one letter out of a, 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 a word, it kind of changes it. Well, not only does this change it, it just kills that, that enzyme. But the reason your cells are good is because, for everybody else, is because your enzyme can't put stuff on the outside of the cells that are, that are bad for other people. Whereas the A's and the B's and the AB's, our enzymes work and we put something on the outside which means that it's only good for us and not for others. So, um, so yeah, blood group O, you guys are the mutants, you're the most common. Um, the A and the B are different from each other 
fight because of these SNPs. There are different, you can see here, there's an A here and a G here and a C and a G. And those differences cause the proteins to be a little different. The people who are AB are ones who have one copy of the A and from mom and one copy of the B from dad or vice versa. So that's how you, you're an AB. So, <coughs> okay, so, so you can see how just something like blood group is determined genetically and there are um, ramifications in terms of population uh, distribution and also medical relevance. Well, we're interested in seeing whether uh, these sorts of variants that are in something as common, or associated with something as common as blood type, is that associated with body mass index or obesity in any way? So the way those studies are done are with these SNPs, and it turns out that there are a lot of SNPs now. This is a 2010, and we're up to you know 20 million of these um, different variations. And included in this 20 million would be those blood group SNPs I just showed you. And there's some for um, uh, any trait you can think of, you know, height, hair color, whatever. So the the whole underlying hypothesis here is that based on the thrifty genotypes that I told you is that our ancestors were selected for the ones who could survive and during the famines and the ice age that they now have those differences those SNPs those variants that allow them to survive and and they're common because obesity is now 30 percent of the population so they these common variants not the rare rare things like leptin or MC4 these must be the reason why people are uh, we have obesity in the current environment and so um, the way these studies are done, let me see if I can, is to look at uh, two groups. So you look at obese and lean. So you take a, a group of obese people and a group of lean people. You take DNA and you analyze their DNA just like I showed you in the blood group at each SNP. And you see whether or not, like in blood group, are there more type A's than type O's? Are there more AB's than, than B's? And you do that each SNP over thousands and thousands, literally a million SNPs. We now will analyze a million of these uh, at a time. And so for, so for example, I'll give you uh, for SNP one. So if a thousand lean people and a thousand obese people, we're looking at this one SNP. So as I told you, you can be from mom and dad, you can have a G and a G or a G and a C or a C and a C. You can be one of these three groups. So if we look at this population and we see about 30% are this, 40% this, 30% this, and then we look at the obese, 28, 41, and 31. Nah, that doesn't look all that different, right? What if, there, what if we looked at this SNP2 and we had this distribution, the lean, but in this distribution, the obese, looked like this, a lot more people have this C. Now, this is where math comes in again because there's, a, there's complex mathematics to figure out whether or not this distribution is different than this one depending on how many people you're starting with um, and how many of these SNPs that you, you analyze. And just as an example, I'll show you. So if we have, notice I, I picked the colors as blue and white, so um, if you have marbles that are blue and white, maybe 100 of them, half are blue, half are white, and you just randomly reached in and pulled out 10, if you did that once, chances are you're going to have five blue and five white. What are the chances if you did it one time that you would come out with all white? Be very, very, very low, right? What if I reached in a hundred times? A little higher. What if I reached in a thousand times? What if I reached in a million times? What are the odds that I might come out with, with one of those handfuls a million times being all white? Much, much higher. That's the problem we have in genetics right now. We're literally looking at a million of these SNPs and seeing whether or not they're, they're distributed differently in obese versus lean. The statisticians give us very strict rules for what we're allowed to say is actually different, how many are actually all white, if you will. And unfortunately, those statistical rules have created the situation where we found obesity genes. 
And I'm showing you, sorry for the busy slide, but if you can just look at BMI right here. So the very first wave, two SNPs near two genes came out, one called uh, FTO, which is, um, uh, ironically, is, is, it's a big gene and was found in mice before it was associated with obesi obesity and was called FATSO because it was a big, big gene. And now it's found with obesity, so now it's called fat mass gene. So they kept the name the same. And the MC4R. So that came in the first, when, when SNPs were looked at, these were the first two genes that came out. Then bigger populations were analyzed and, and another series of genes came out. And then more recently, there's been even more work done. We're now up to hundreds of thousands of people looking at millions of these SNPs. And we've now found these genes and the problem is they don't account for most of the obesity that we find. They're associated, but the risk that they confer for, for obesity is very small. And that has led to, and I don't know if previous speakers may have sp spoken about this, it's called the missing heritability. It's like we have all these variations, and yet we're doing our analysis, and they're not explaining why people are getting obese or Height is another example. Uh, people are trying to find the genes that are responsible for height. So part of the, let me just make sure. So part of the problem is people are looking at these one at a time. Well, if you, it, this study took 16 of these, and if you actually look at the, the, the variant or the SNP that is the, um, the obesity uh, susceptibility one. If you look to see how many of those you have as a person and then look at BMI, the more of these SNPs that are related to obesity you have, the higher your body mass index is. So it's, it's directly related. The problem is it doesn't explain a whole lot of BMI. This is from 25 to 27. So it's only about two BMI units that, that these genes explain, which is less than what originally uh, we were expecting. The reason probably is, and it's just now coming out, that it was particularly found in height, that it all has to do with the statistical measures for determining whether this is by chance or not. If you pull, the, if you pull all, if you, took, if you just reach in once and you pull out all white marbles versus you do it a million times. If you do it a million times, chances are, yes, you're going to by chance pull out one. Well, it turns out a lot of the SNPs that in the studies, they were not considered statistically significant, meaning that they didn't think, they thought they were just happening by random chance. It turns out that that's probably not the case and that there's just a lot of them, meaning there's hundreds to thousands more. And they're actually, if, you, if we could do a study, which has not been done yet, but if we could do a study where instead of trying to add up just like, 13 or 16, if we could add up hundreds of these, then we would be explaining a lot more of the BMI. And so it turns out it's just a lot more complicated than we thought, and there's a lot more genes that each have each a little bit of effect, and they're very hard to detect because there's so many of them and they only contribute a little bit of effect. So that's ongoing work, and that's actually not just for, for obesity and body mass index, but for height and for other uh, uh, traits as well, like lipids, uh, blood lipids, and diabetes, and whatnot. The interesting thing, though, for most of those genes that have been found so far, almost all of them have to do with the brain. Originally going in, I think the, the, the scientists were, were expecting that, as I mentioned, there's um, uh, intake and expenditure, that metabolism, or something related to expenditure, genes related to expenditure would be found. That has not been the case to date. Almost all of the genes, now there's some genes we just have no idea what they're doing, so they could very well be related to metabolism, but right now most of the genes look like they're all related to the brain and feeding behavior, appetite and satiety or, or feeling full afterward. Okay, um, so now I'll, I'll, I'll switch gears from the SNPs that I talked about and the genetics to a different form of genetics, which is kind of a novel concept that 
um, has, has been um, being investigated in a number of fields. And that is, um, it turns out there are far more cells in your gut than in your body. But the cells are bacteria. It turns out we are all, we have lots of bacteria that live inside of our intestine. It's, it's, a, a, um, it's a good thing. <laughs> um, and there's just now been work going on that has been studying uh, the bacteria that live in the intestine and how those bacteria may interface with different diseases. So one, one uh, type of disease that, that has been very uh, uh, investigated is inflammatory bowel disease, obviously, because it's a disease that affects the bowel, affects the gut. But there have been studies now done um, with uh, obesity. And the reason that there's a, now an interest is that the energy that you, you, in, you take in or that you eat, most of that in the small intestine is absorbed by digestion. And so that's how you obtain most of your calories or as you, as you eat them into the small intestine, you absorb them. But not all the food is digested fully and some of it goes to the large intestine where most of the bacteria are. Now, these bacteria metabolize that food that's going through the, and, and so they can, the ba those bacteria can actually um, generate uh, small fatty acids or, or can, can create lipids and further digest the food. So depending on what bacteria you may have in the intestine, you may get different amounts of energy from these bacteria. And so, and that will obviously, that's, a, that's energy going into your body instead of uh, uh, um, going out. So that's become um, uh, an area of invest very recent investigation um, for uh, the relationship to obesity and metabolic disease. So let me just focus your attention down to here. So it turns out that if you just look at the bacteria in mice, the OB mice that I showed you that have the leptin problem, they don't make leptin and are the really large mice, if you look at their, the bacteria in their intestine, it's, the bacteria are different than in the lean mice or in um, um, mice who are only heterozygous and are, 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 uh, don't carry two copies of the obese. So in mice, it's clear that there are differences in obese people in, or in obese mice of uh, the bacteria composition in the intestine, small in the large intestine. There are types of mice that can be raised in a special uh, lab where they basically don't have any bacteria in their, in their intestine. They're called germ-free mice, so you can raise them so that they're, they're, uh, they don't have uh, a significant amount of, of bacteria. Well, it turns out that if you look at those mice and compare them to the same mice but who are not in the germ-free, they have a lot of metabolic uh, advantages. They increased insulin sensitivity, they handle lipids better, um, uh, and, and uh, other aspects of, of metabolism better. So there's, a, there's a, um, a hypothesis after observing this that maybe the, not only do the bacteria in the gut can affect obesity, but can it also affect metabolism, such as diabetes? Oops, I should have given you a, a spoiler alert here for something that's a kind of a, a gross um, uh, topic, but um, we'll see how we do. It's, there's an emerging area called fecal transplantation. Sounds pretty gross, and probably is. Um, here's a, a diagram of, of taking donor feces so donor poo, filtering it, and uh, preparing it to transplant into a host or a person that um, uh, there's some antibiotics given to and enemas to clear out their, their, um, in their own bacteria from their colon, and then instilling the donor bacteria to try to replace the bacteria that are in that person's um, uh, intestine. When that's done in mice, you can take um, mice who are normal lean mice 
and you do just what I said. You give them antibiotics, clean out their colon, and then reintroduce uh, fecal bacteria from a lean or from the, the OB OB mouse, and then see what happens to their weight. So you can turn the lean mouse into a fat mouse by giving them the bacteria from the intestine of the OB OB mice. Now, this is a, it's not, it, it's a part of, uh, you don't turn them into complete obese mice, but you make them gain weight. So you can actually modify their body weight depending on what type of bacteria are in their colon. Um, there have been initial trials in people with type 2 diabetes where that's been done from lean, normal people into type 2 diabetics with significant corrections of triglycerides and, um, and insulin uh, measures. The problem is, at least in people, that the, back, the antibiotics and the, the enemas and the cleansing of the colon, it's almost like, for those of you who may have had colonoscopies, it's that kind of prep. Um, it does not completely eliminate your own bacteria. And so even though you get donor bacteria in, which grows and has an effect, over a period of weeks, your own bacteria overgrows that and reestablishes itself. It turns out that the bacteria that you have residing in your colon likely were, were set by the time you were about two years old. Now, there are some influences during that time, but, um, and, and, it's, it's, and it's almost, it's for the most part fixed. You can modulate some of it, but, but it will regrow. So that's been a, very, a problem in this field is you can't keep having people every month or two go through a colonoscopy prep type deal. It's just not practical. Um, so this is an emerging area that, um, again, this is very, uh, the, the, the paper on the, um, or the, the project dealing with the diabetics has not even really been published yet. So this is mainly based in mouse work and is now, um, um, it was reported at a meeting but has, has not come out in print. Okay, so in the last part, um, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the, my work that I've done on um, uh, trying to treat uh, patients with, with extreme or severe obesity um, with bariatric surgery uh, and the, the um, type of surgery that, that we've been studying is called the RUNY gastric bypass, or for short, we'll call it gastric bypass. And for those of you who may be familiar with some of the um, bariatric surgeries, you may know of the, um, the band procedure, which is just basically, uh, it's put a, 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 a device is put around the stomach to sort of constrict it so it can't expand, and, and that's a restrictive procedure. That's not what this is. This is a surgery. This is a significant surgery where the, this is the normal anatomy where from the esophagus into the stomach, into the small intestine, that's how food normally goes. Well. The surgery uh, cuts the stomach away from the esophagus except for a little pouch, so just this tiny bit of stomach here. And then way down here, a, uh, the small intestine is cut, and that's brought up to be attached up here. So the food comes down the esophagus into a very tiny part of stomach and then goes right into the intestine that's, that bypasses or is after the first part, which is where most of the food gets absorbed. So this attacks the, um, it, it, it tries to reduce the, the, the portions, the amount of food that is in the stomach, and also you don't absorb it very well. It's called malabsorptive because it's being dumped into the intestine way far down past this initial part where most of the absorbing goes in. The stomach and this initial part are then reconnected down here. So all of the stomach acids and the bile and everything still flow and are connected into the intestine, but that's why it forms a sort of Y. You can see this is one upper part stem of the Y, another upper stem, and this is the lower stem. So that's where they get the, the Y from. So this is a very significant surgery. This is not just something to, to restrict the stomach. This is a, a, a big deal. It's mainly done on people who've got a BMI of 40 or more, but now it's down, you, if you have a BMI of 35, but you have a medical con condition such as diabetes or 
high blood pressure or some significant uh, medical condition, you would qualify. We looked at um, about 1,000 patients. Uh, for the most part, as is the case across the country, about 80% of the people are, uh, patients are female. They're in their uh, mid to late 40s. Um, as for central Pennsylvania, it was overwhelmingly uh, Caucasian, and their BMI was just about 50. So you can see this is a pretty, pretty large, uh, uh, heavy population. So the first thing we looked at was in that MC4R. Remember I showed you there are rare variants? Well, it turns out there are some of these common SNP variants in MC4R. There's actually uh, two of them. It turns out one of them has been associated with leanness. So just like I said, a rheostat where you can increase appetite, well, it turns out one of these variants, it looks like you can decrease appetite. One of these, that variant, it turns out was, this is weight loss after bariatric surgery. These patients with that variant lost more weight and kept it off than the patients that had uh, the other variant or, or were normal. So we think that this lean variant, even though it's found in these very large people, once they have the surgery, it's able to uh, exert its effect and actually helps these patients lose more weight. We've also, we also did, uh, we looked at some of the common variants I told you in that FTO or FATSO gene and, 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 an, and a different MC4R variant. We did the same thing of just counting. We had these four genes, four obesity genes, one from mom, one from dad. So if you've got, both of them are the obesity variants, you would we'd get a score of two. If both of them were the normal, you would get a score of zero. We just add up zero, one, two for each of these genes. So you get a score from zero to eight. Uh, eight meaning that you're at highest risk for um, obesity uh, genes and, and zero meaning you're, you're not. We looked at the number of alleles just like that previous uh, graph I showed you and it turns out the number of alleles you had goes right up with your BMI. So if you're loaded up with these obesity genes, you tend to be heavier than somebody who's not, doesn't carry them. We then looked at um, uh, after surgery and I just want to have you look at from the yellow, uh, green, blue, red here. So this is, again, this is when the surgery was and they lose weight and they come down. If you, if you, the yellow here are the people who had none of the alleles, so they lost the most weight. And then the ones who had uh, one to two, three or four, or five or greater. So it was also linear with um, just like their initial BMI, the amount of weight they lost after surgery is also related. One of the reasons we think this is very important is that the surgery is very severe and does a significant anatomic uh, uh, change, but the genetics don't change. So again, it's, it's like the, you know, we're sort of changing the environment, if you will, by rearranging the intestine, but the genetics are still there, and there are significant numbers of people who, as you can see here, you have people, they start gaining weight again, and there are people who will gain their weight right back. So they go through this, in, this expensive, very significant procedure, and then they're back to where they started from. So we're trying to figure out ahead of time, can we predict who that is, and can we do something different so they don't end up back wh where they were? And if not, is there something else we can do based on the genes we found? Okay, so I think this is almost my last slide. Um, I'll, I'll show you here just in also to, to drive home genetics. So this is similar type graphs that I just showed you. This is weight loss after bariatric surgery. You can see here. Now, uh, I have two patients here and two patients here. Which side do you think are the identical twins? Who votes for this? Who votes for this? You guys are all right. Those are, the, those are two sets of identical twins. Out of about 1,000 patients, we happened to notice, we actually, we didn't know this until we did their genetics, and then we realized, whoa, we thought there was a sample mix-up, that, that it was the same sample twice. It was actually just two people who were identical twins. And then we looked at their weight loss, and it was very striking how similar it was. And, and these, they didn't have it at the same time either. These are like distant in, in time, so, so the, the, the genetics is really pretty strong uh, versus uh, these are two uh, random patients that we, we, 
matched and put together. So we think there's, there's very strong genetic influences uh, going on here. And so really, this is my ending, next to last slide, and I think this is a struggle that in an obesogenic environment that we're, we're all facing depending on who our ancestors were, that you're, you're battling genes in, in a given environment. And so then I'd just like to thank uh, Barbara and the organizers for uh, inviting me, um, the new uh, Penn State Hershey Institute for Personalized Medicine, my collaborators uh, in bariatric surgery, Chris Still and Taraj Murshahi at Geisinger, and then the various funding agencies, um, NIH, uh, Penn, the state of Pennsylvania, Geisinger, and Penn State. Thank you. Ti time for your questions. Uh, please hold your applause. We can thank uh, Dr. Later. Um, so, hand your questions, hold them up high, please. Okay. Um, what, uh, so the first question, what mysteries related to obesity are you now trying to solve in your research programs? Okay. Um, as I showed you, the, the, um, the weight loss after bariatric, bariatric surgery that occurs, we're very much interested in what are the genetic variants that are associated with those different outcomes. Oh, right. Um, it turns out that bariatric surgery has an effect on the other disorders of obesity as well. Um, one of the things that is a, 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 an observation that has been known for 30 or 40 years now that is completely unexplained is that patients who have type 2 diabetes, within hours after that surgery, their, di their type 2 diabetes can resolve. They haven't lost any weight. It, it's literally within hours. There's something about that surgery of rearranging the intestine that's causing some factor to be released or some factor to, to, to stop being released. Something is going on because there is an effect within literally hours in many patients with type 2 diabetes that resolves their diabetes. It's essentially they're cured with this surgery. No one knows what that is. That's one thing that we're very interested in finding out. The other thing is their, their hypertension improves, their lipids improve, um, uh, various aspects of their uh, psychological state improve, but not in everybody. And again, we think that there may be genetics that, in, that underlie why some people get good improvements and some people don't. If you're predisposed to high lipids to begin with and you have a BMI of 50, just because after surgery, if you get down to a BMI of 30 or 25, your lipids still may be high because of your genetics. And so we're trying to figure out, is that the reason why some people improve and some people don't? So I think that's, right now, those are the major issues. For the field of obesity, as I indicated, it's brain genes. I think that um, what the field really needs is we need a very good drug that can control appetite or satiety. There are just not any of them out there. The field has had um, the FenFen debacle. There's been, there's been other obesity drugs that have been developed and have failed. There's very little on the market right now. There's a bunch in trials, and, and companies are developing them, and there's some that are very promising. But I think that's really what the field needs. Um, there is an interesting, there's a, there's a potential alternative to the, um, to the surgery, and that is, uh, it turns out that if you, you can block the absorption, and, and if there's a, like a, a plastic tube, if you will, that can be put down and block the absorption into the, into the small intestine, that has many uh, uh, similarities to the surgery, and, and you don't have to undergo the, the surgery. So those are sort of technologies that are also uh, that are out there. But in terms of my own uh, lab uh, research interests, I think the, the variants that are influencing outcomes and then why the heck does type 2 diabetes resolve uh, quickly. Assuming, oops. Sorry. That's right. <laughs> Assuming that a solution can be found for the repeated colon prep process, how popular do you feel the fecal transplant therapy is likely to become among patients? Yeah, so I think for if, if that can be 
figured out. I think for potential for patients with type 2 diabetes who have to go, you know, they're sticking themselves and injecting insulin and whatever, um, you know, a colonoscopy is not great, but if you only have to do it once, I guess that would be worth it. Um, I think until then, though, what is going to eventually happen is right now that transplanting from one person to another is pretty crude, I mean, to be honest with you. I think what will eventually happen is we're going to figure out what bacteria are the ones responsible, and that'll be grown in a, you know, a drug company, and, and it'll, be a, it'll be a medicine. It won't be a transplant. And so I think right now we're just very, very early on. One of the reasons that um, we're able to do this research right now is, I, and, and I don't know if you guys, if, if probably Eric Green talked about this a couple of weeks ago, the technologies for analyzing the DNA of the bacteria are now uh, much greater than we had before. So we can now sequence the bacteria and find out to very fine degrees. Turns out bacteria are different from each other too, just like people. <laughs> and just because you grow them in a colony and, and you have them on a plate, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of subtlety there that we're just now tr starting to figure out because we now have the technology to do it. And so the more that's applied, eventually it's going to become essentially a drug, I think, like, like the probiotics are now that people are trying to use it'll be a, a manufacturing process and not a transplant. But this is early days. This is, this is you know, at the forefront, the cutting edge, and that's what all we have right now. How do, you, how do you determine that the weight gain is from muscle as opposed to fat? Mm. So that's determining lean body mass. So there are a number of ways to do that. The, the, the most practical and simplest is the caliper method, where you just do this pinch yourself and feel if it's fat or not. Um, more sophisticated than that, there are, um, we have, uh, 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 it's called a, a, a bod pod, which is, looks like a, a big egg, you sit in it, and it inflates the thing with air, and it can figure out based on the pressure what your relative fat versus muscle is. There are other things where you have to actually drink heavy water, the deuterium labeled water, like in the, the, urane, or the, the nuclear days. It doesn't hurt, it's not, it's not a, a uh, it doesn't hurt anything, but you're able to measure then what part of your body is lean and what part is fat. You can do a CAT scan, a DEXA. Those of you who have had uh, bone mineral densities done with DEXA, you can do that similar type thing to, to look at how much is lean and how much is fat. So that's actually a, a complicated area, but you know, again, the simplest thing is that, that old caliper method. You can just go around your body and just pinch to see if it's muscle or fat. And, there are two questions about leptin. Is, uh, what is the source of leptin protein? And also, is there any research being done on leptin resistance? Um, the source is fat, for the most part. It's a little more complicated than that, but, but really it's, it's adipose cells, out of uh, fat tissue. Um, leptin resistance is an interesting uh, phenomenon, and there, there is a, a lot of work going on. That's, that's not my area, so I, I can't really comment uh, too much on that. Um, I do know some of the folks that was discovered at Rockefeller, and, and um, there's a couple of folks there who are still doing uh, really, really elegant work. Uh, Rudy Leibels is one of them, um, uh, and I think that's, that's where his area is. I just don't know what he's been, been doing. What happens to the stomach after Ru and Yi? Ru and Y. Ru and Y surgery. Does it uh, atrophy or does it shrink? Uh, yeah, it, it, does, it doesn't atrophy. It still works. Uh, it, it shrinks because it's not being, there's no food going in to cause it to, to expand. So, and, and the reason it's, it's, a, it's the Y, so all the, it still can secrete acid. And, and then don't forget, right past that, the pancreas and the bile are, are connected to the small intestine, and you need to have those things too. So that all is all connected. So it, it's, it's what's in called the remnant part, but it all goes in the intestine. So um, it, does, it, it will shrink, though. That's, that's for certain. A related question, does that surgery affect um, how full a person feels? Yes. Um, yes, because you feel, so part of, of satiety or feeling full is there are stretch receptors in the stomach. So as the stomach begins to stretch, it signals to your brain that, uh-oh, I'm starting to get full. Well, if your stomach is now only three ounces instead of, I don't know, a quart or whatever it can normally hold, yeah, it starts to stretch right away and, and you get signals. The problem is, are you genetically able to, to sense those signals? I mean, that's what we don't know. 
Can you say something about the relationship between certain psychotropic medications and significant increase in weight? Yeah, so this is another area that the, the second and third generation antipsychotic medications. Um, I, I'm also doing research in the genetics of weight gain related to those medications. Um, uh, this was a project that, that we did at, um, we're doing at Geisinger and with Group Health in Seattle. Um, we were, a couple, couple interesting things about that work. So these are drugs that for the most part are considered to be for people who have uh, various psychiatric illnesses and their mainstays of therapy for you know, schizophrenia and manic depressive disorder and some other things. However, in the last probably five, 10 years, they've been used for a lot of other different uh, uh, situations. And in fact, one of the things that we were, the research we did was to try to find when, the, when a drug, there's a list of about 10 or 12 of these drugs, when was the drug given, how often, and what happened to body weight after they were given the drug? Because we're looking for the people who gained a lot of body weight. So 25, 50% of their body weight over a year. I mean, that's a huge weight gain in a year. What we found was a lot of times these drugs are given, we, we were finding a lot of body weight, but it was due to pregnancy. Because these drugs are given like postpartum depression. I was stunned by how frequently these drugs are, are administered in the community, not for what are considered the severe psychiatric. Anyway, we're in the, in the middle of, uh, of, of a project where we've collected samples and we're gonna now do genetic analysis of those SNPs to see if any of those SNPs are related to people who have gained a lot of weight after being put on these medications. But it is a, it can be a really substantial amount of weight gain. A lot of people gain weight a modest amount of weight, five or 10 percent, but there's a significant fraction that can gain 25 to 50 percent of their body weight in a year. Isn't it the aim of oral probiotics the same as for fecal transplantation? For, uh, that is a change in the gut flora. Do um, oral probiotics have any promise? Yeah, so obviously that would be a much preferred way of, of getting bugs to your gut if you um, the problem with the oral probiotics is you have to go through the stomach and the small intestine by the time you get to the colon. And the whole job of the stomach and the small intestine is to, to take whatever you eat and to break it up into tiny little things that are not able to live anymore. So um, the, if you, the transplantation is sort of a, it's a way to get a huge dose in there versus a, a, the oral route. Although that's, that's, I mean, obviously that would be the preferred way and, and people are now looking at trying to use probiotics to, to influence the, the, the guts or the, the bacteria. It's called the microbiome, or in, like the genome is all the genes, the microbiome is all the microbes. So trying to influence the composition of the microbiome in the gut. Is there a relationship between diet and exercise and blood type? Well, <laughs> so in the 1970s, probably 60s to 70s, there was a cottage industry that related blood type to every known possible factor there was. And you could go back through the literature and you could find lots and lots and lots of associations. The problem is, as you just saw in the audience, you know, there's significant proportions of people who are O and A and, 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 and even B, and it's hard to really, there, there's not one thing that they all share that's different than the other group, so it's very difficult to associate that. As far as I know, I'm, I'm not aware of any. There could be. Like I said, there's been a lot of studies associating blood type with all sorts of different things. I do know that one of the things that, that blood type, the reason we have different, I mean, that's a, why do we have different blood types? Well, it turns out that the gene that's mutated in you O people, um, that the, the, the protein that's able to be made puts different molecules on the outside of the red blood cells and other cells. Well, it turns out some viruses glom onto those to get inside cells. So there are some areas of the world, you go in South America, there are areas that are all O. There's nobody who's an A or a B. And that's likely because there was some virus, probably um, you know, um, 
one of the, the plagues that came through, bubonic plague, some major infectious disease came through, and that microorganism needed the A or B um, gene, the, the, the molecule that the, the A and the B people could put on their cell, needed that to get in the cell to, to, to kill your cells and, and die from the virus or, or the bugs. So it killed off all the A's and the B's because they happened to have the genes that, and left only the O's. But I have no idea about exercise, sorry. This question is a bit related to your answer. If yesterday's survival selection conditioned genes for today's obesity, will today's survival selection condi condition genes to lead to the lean? Well, there's, there's no survival, I guess, because, so, so here's the, so this goes back to basic evolution, and that is, the survivors are the ones who pass their genes on. Once you pass your genes on, evolution could care less about you for the most part. So once you've had your kids, that's the next generation, you have really no impact on the gene pool after that. So unless there was, unless the, pe the, the pediatric obesity epidemic creates such a big problem where kids get so fat that they can't even live to reproduce, then I don't think that's gonna happen. I read that lipids store toxins. Thus, some people might store lipids as protection from a toxic environment. Is there any truth to this? Well, there's definitely the truth that lipids store potential toxins. So fat, it, it's, it's, you know, if you have a large fat mass, your blood flows through there. If you're inhaling or ingesting things that get into your bloodstream, toxins or chemicals, that can dissolve into the fat, they will. It's basic chemistry. It'll, if it's high in your blood and it's not in the fat, it'll get into your fat. Um, what, what has been interesting is, it's actually probably the reverse that happens when people lose weight and they start releasing those things. So that's been an area of investigation. In particular, uh, not a toxin, but it turns out that um, a lot of obese people are vitamin D deficient. How can you be vitamin D deficient if your caloric intake is so high, you're probably ingesting so much vitamin D compared to, to somebody else? Well, it could be that it's all stored in their fat because vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin and it's tucked away in the fat and it's not in the blood. So you measure it in the blood, it's not there because it's all in the fat. So that's an area that is, is being investigated because that's been observed. The toxins, I know that's been, uh, it's not, again, not in my area, but there are increased, certain cancers are increased with obesity, and that's been sort of one of the hypotheses that, that the fat can serve as a sink to kind of draw out those toxins, but I don't know if there's any, I don't know what work's been done. You've generated a lot of interest in gut bacteria. Oh, okay. What happens to gut microbiota after surgery? Aha. Yes, that's also an area that we're, we're interested in. And in fact, um, the way, <laughs> so <clears throat> we've got uh, those patients who get bariatric surgery, we are in the process of collecting stool samples from those patients at different time points after surgery. And I can tell you that um, we give them a kit that they take home and they, they assemble the kit, put it in a bag, put it in an envelope and mail it back to us and it comes to my mailbox. And so I got my mailbox moved down to the bottom <laughs> because <laughs> nobody wanted to be below. <laughs> so we don't know yet. So that's a, that's a great question and we're trying to figure that out. Can gut bacteria change when moving from one part of the country or the world to another? So I'm not, so I think the answer to that is probably yes, because it turns out that different parts of the world have different, like the continents have their own sort of unique pattern of gut bacteria. Now, the, the, the issue is I'm, I'm sure it will change to some degree, especially it can, you can change it based on, I mean, probiotics. The, the trouble is that there are lots of different types of bacteria that live in the gut, and you can probably change 20% of them, but that core 80% are kind of what are going to, like from age two and on, that's what you got. Now, it, it's very interesting. No one's really figured out, well, what is it at between birth and age two? How, did, how does that determine? I remember talking to um, 
a, a geneticist from Wisconsin who's, whose husband was a dairy farmer, and she said she'd go out in the morning before work to help her husband, and she'd take the kids and put them next to what the cows would eat, and the kids would be, you know, they're on a farm. They're just, so what, what her, her kid's microbiome like compared to, you know, a kid raised in this, I don't know. It's, these are all unanswered questions. And then what, what impact does that have later on? If obesity increases the risk of cancer, will we see an increase in cancer in the next 20 years? I think yes, but the, 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 it's, it's not like tobacco. You know, it's not, it's not strong, strong. Um, I think it may have a measurable impact just because the numbers are so great. I mean, we're up at 30% now, obese. Um, just because of that larger number, it may have an impact on, on the, the couple of cancers that are related. Um, but it's not, it's not as strong a risk factor as some of the other uh, things like smoking. So it could be, we'll see. I'm hoping not because I hope we can get, uh, there are some early signs that, that the increase is slowing and I'm hoping that the increase actually t plateaus and we, we get to some steady state of, in terms of obesity. Is a person born with a set number of fat cells that never changes? Um, that was the originally thought, but no, fat cells can actually divide. But again, it's are you born with 80% of the amount you're ever going to have, and, and or not born with? But it's actually not. It's probably not born with, but it's set early in life that your your um, th that number is more or less defined, and then what happens after that is you increase the size as you as you add more lipid to the storage. Turns out that that's not entirely true. Cells can divide after that. They can also die. That's another thing. As you lose weight, you get, you get fat cell death. Um, but I, that's, that's, not, that's not my area there. That is an area of active investigation, though. There's also different kinds of fat. There's white fat, which is what everybody thinks about in terms of that's, there's also what's called brown fat. And the reason it's brown is it, um, <coughs> the reason your muscles and meat is brown is because the, the iron in it that is in the mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of the cell to make energy, this fat has a lot of those mitochondria in it, and it's called brown. In, especially in animals, in mice, the mitochondria can generate heat. They don't have to make energy, they can generate heat. So that brown fat is actually good in, in hibernators to generate heat. Unfortunately, people have very little brown fat because that's one of the things if you, can, if you can, instead of storing your energy, you know, all the calories you eat, instead of storing that as lipids or fat, if you can have your mitochondria burn it and just release it as energy, that might be a way to, to, to get rid of calories. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of brown fat. What investigators are trying to do, though, is turn white fat into brown fat. And so they're trying to figure out, can we get your fat and the mitochondria in there to start burning those lipids and release it as energy? And then you might have to, you know, move north because then you might feel hot all the time. But other than that. These are our last two questions, and they're related, so I'll read them both at the same time. Okay. Um, let's see. As a doctor, what preventative measures can you recommend for our society? And the other question is, what are the most promising approaches to prevention of obesity as opposed to treating obesity after it has occurred? Yeah, well, I'll start with the, the second one first. So that's, a, that's absolutely the um, preventing the problem is by far better than bariatric surgery or any of the, 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 the problem of treating it after the fact, obviously, is that we don't have anything that works. The, the, the diet and the exercise programs, most people can lose some weight, and they, but they, they cycle. They go back and forth, and it's just the continuing battle. It's like the, the, you know, it's the arm wrestling with the DNA, and it's, it's it's really problematic, and again, it's different in the population, again, I think because of genetics. If you're loaded up with obesity genes, your brain responds differently, and that's hard for people who, who are not, uh, don't have those genes to realize. You're just, the signals are different, you respond different, you feel different, and in that environment, it's really tough to, to control. Um, I think, you know, obviously the kids, and, and, and finding some way to stop kids from being obese to start with, because that's actually the more worrisome thing at this point is not only are the, the maps I showed with the adults, but it's increasing in, in children. 
and they're starting a lot earlier with the metabolic problems, meaning that, and they're gonna, that means we're gonna have a bigger problem with them when they're in their 20s, 30s, and 40s than if the weight gain started in your 20s, 30s, and 40s. Um, the problem is right now, um, we, d we don't have any, you know, it's the environment. I don't know how you, how you call back all those potato chips and the McDonald's. I mean, it's a good thing we have food around compared to, you know, 1942 in, in Europe. I mean, it's, it's, we're better off now than we were then. Um, it's just problematic. Um, I think from a medical point of view, I think we need a safe drug. That's to treat it right now. I think that would be, that would be a huge help at this point. Now we can give a big thank you to Dr. Glenn Gerhard. Thank you. Great.